praises to the God of the Bible. For our God is good and worthy to be praised. He's worthy, he's worthy. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for blessing us to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you, oh God, for causing your face to shine upon us. And thank you, Lord, for a mind to come and to worship, to bow down, to lift up our God. Lord, you are as Moses said in the 15th chapter of Exodus, you are God and our song. You've also become our salvation. Oh, you're my God. And Father, we ask that you bless us today as we teach, preach the word of God. With power and authority. With power and authority. Let the word sink deep in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Give the God of the Bible praises. What a mighty God we serve. You might be seated in the house of the Lord. Welcome to our 8 a.m. service. We give honor to all whom honor is due. And I would like to call your attention to God's holy word. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. The Lord has certainly blessed us uh, in our time. Uh, in this chapter. And one of the things to me that even in studying these things and studying these historical events that Moses said, that Paul said happened and were written for our admonition, it shows how current the Bible is. This That book that you have there in your lap is more current than tomorrow morning's newspaper. Before you pick up the Times, the Post, before you pick up the News and Observer, before you pick up any of these uh, publications, and you can trust today very few of them, the Washington Examiner, you name it, uh, before you pick up those things and read them, I strongly advise you to read the Word of God. Because if you want to know what's happening in society, God's Word speaks to everything that is taking place place, whether it is in the world or the church, whether it is our responses or response or lack thereof, uh, the Bible covers it all. First Corinthians chapter, chapter 10 and verse uh, 10 is where we are today. Uh, I'm not reading one through uh, uh, 12 as I have been, because if you followed us, um, you know, you've kept us uh, up with us enough to know that uh, uh, this particular chapter, Paul deals with all of the advantages that God gave to Israel and how uh, despite the advantages that God gave them in his supernatural interventions, verse 5 tells us, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. And he tells why God was not well pleased. And among the things that he mentioned, we talked about last a Thursday night, it says, and neither let us tempt Christ. And they tempted him, that is, they refused to obey God, refused to obey Christ until Christ showed them what they needed to see. Isn't that some uh, attitude to present before the Lord? Well, God, I won't obey you. God, I won't do what you say until you do thus and so. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to prove to me that you are God and that you're in charge or otherwise, Lord, I'm not going to move. Oh, you got to, you got to really be high on yourself to approach the true and living God like that. Who could, if he wanted to just wipe us out, could just wipe you out. And he says, as some of them tempted him, their intentions was to prove that Christ had failed them. So that attitude wasn't one waiting for the Lord to really show his power. Uh, they had come to the conclusion that God had failed them. So uh, he says, let us, uh, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Today, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured 
and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them. For examples that they are written for our admonition. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world has come. He says, verse 10, and neither, neither murmur ye, neither murmur ye. And this, this word here, murmur, um, comes from a, a Greek word uh, that literally means to, to mutter or to complain under your breath. I don't care what he's saying. I'm not going to do that. Moses can say what he wants to say. But I'm not going along with that kind of stuff. God speaks to me too. I hear that stuff Bishop wouldn't be saying. But I ain't can say what he want to, honey child. God has given me some sense. I, I can think for myself. And I can reason for myself. And I have some sense. That's what, that's, 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 that's what it means. To mutter and to complain underneath your breath. He can say what he want to say. They can say what they want to say. And the child, don't you be a fool. Mm -mm. You got to have some sense. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they say. God have said. I'm not going over uh, into no um, Canaan. Hmm. Hmm. They're stronger than we are over there. They're deadly. They're violent. They have COVID. I don't care what you say. Mm -mm, no, 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 sir. Gugazo is the word. To murder, to complain, to talk back. Uh, under your breath. Father, bless us now as we preach. In Jesus' name, amen. We're still talking about examples and admonitions, biblical examples and admonitions. You know, Elder Wilson, we, we did this piggybacking the men's conference, the leadership conference. And, uh, and so we're still on this because I think that we get our greatest examples uh, from the Bible because the Bible... Uh, is is right, and the Bible is God's word, and um, um, uh, Psalm thirty three and verse four says, "For the word of the Lord is right," and, and we're going to stick with the Bible. Um, let's let's look at what Paul was talking about here. We're going to read the Bible this morning. We got you know I I I didn't misspeak when I said God bless us on this preach. Teach Sunday. I didn't. Um, I didn't mean to say teach and said preach, and I didn't mean to say preach and said teach. I meant to say both of them because probably that's what we'll do. A little preach teaching today, and I know you have your Bibles. So what Moses here uh, is referencing is, is 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 an event that took place in Numbers chapter number 14. Would you turn to Numbers chapter number 14? And we're going to look at Numbers chapter number 13. And we're also going to look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter number 1. And uh, uh, all of these things speaks to uh, what took place and and you, you, you'll be able to, to connect the dots and see the parallels of what was going on then uh, to what we see that is going on in the world now. Do you have Numbers chapter number 14? It reads as follows, And all the congregation lifted up their voice 
and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured. Loon um, is the Hebrew word here for murmured. Uh, it, it literally means here, um, it literally means to, to be obstinate, to complain, to lodge, to refuse to move. They complained, they murmured, they said we are not changing our positions we're not going to change our positions physically nor will we change our minds they uh, dropped their anchor and said we don't care what Moses said mm -mm. we're not we're not going to do it it says and they murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, to Moses and Aaron, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. You see the exclamation point there? They're screaming. They, they lost it. Quite like some of these preachers you would see on Facebook and all this stuff, these guys. They had the Trump derangement syndrome. They lost all class, all control. You know, it's, it's all right to be for or against who you want, but you ought to at least have some sense. Amen. People went crazy. I, have, I haven't seen men, uh, those same men, I've never seen them get that uh, worked up uh, over abortion, over sin. I mean, all animated, just, I mean, what in the world? So Lord, these people have lost their minds. You don't hear my preaching today. They, 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 they were, uh, they said, would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Would to God literally, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Would, would God would God, not would to God, would God, if only we had died in the world, in this wilderness. And where they were was not a pretty place. Uh, Kadesh Barnea was not somewhere where you'd want to live. Hard rocks, hard stones, a depressed area. In fact, the whole wilderness was a depressed, low-lying, a strip of desert uh, from uh, Sinai to Kadesh, most of it was rocky, hard terrain, filled with limestones. Uh, it was not, uh, you know, most of us, we're, we're accustomed to walking on uh, smooth terrain because most people, many people live in the city limits and uh, if, if nothing else, you walk on the sidewalk a lot. And when, when you go to work, we're walking on smooth terrain. It's all uneven. It was a rough place. And they said, would to God that we would have died in the wilderness. Now, why were they talking this way? Let's go to the chapter number 13. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read something. And then we're going to go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 13 says, because see, th th this plan, was D-O-A because, dead on arrival, because it was not God's A plan. It was not God's best. It's, it's what happens when God goes along with us. Sometimes he loves us so much that he'll go along with us because we're too dumb to go along with him. And he'll try to work through going along with us because he loves us so. He wants, God wants everybody to be saved. I mean, aren't you glad for the love of Christ? 
I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad he loves me the way that he does because in his love you find mercy. You find grace. You find that the Lord puts up with a whole lot. <laughs> it's a good thing. Thank you for loving me, Lord. Uh, but disobedience can get you in trouble with God. And it, it's, it's never really good when God acquiesces or when God goes along with us. Now, chapter 13, verse 1 says, And Moses spake, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now, what is clear in verse um, 1 of chapter 13 it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses. And brothers and sisters, God did. But before God told Moses this, God had told Moses something else. Uh, that puts Numbers 13 and 1 into a very different context. Although Numbers 13 and 1 is true, Numbers 13 and 1 was spoken only after something God had said in Deuteronomy chapter number 1. See, now turn to the book of Deuteronomy. See, the Bible, the Bible is amazing. And, the book, and, and in chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, Moses is giving a history lesson. He's giving a recount. It's 40 years later. All right? And uh, he knows that he is, his time is about up. Um, um, and so he, he's speaking to them. And verse 1 says, <coughs> excuse me. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side, Jordan, on the east side, in the wilderness, in the plain, over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban, and Hezeroth and Dizahab. Now, he says this parenthetically as Moses is speaking. There are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. This is very important uh, that you, 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 you get this. Uh, uh, Brother um, um, Dooley, uh, I want to show you, I've been showing you all maps. I want to show you this. See, there's a, there's a, from, from, from Mount Sinai in this region right here to Kadesh Barnea, in this region here is, um, where's the Dead Sea? Dead Sea right there. In this region is 150 miles. All right? See that? And it is, I need to show them, they told them I need to make sure both sides. See, that's Dead Sea. That's Kadesh. It's the Red Sea down here. So there. From down in here, way down Sinai Peninsula, uh, this is where this is, all right? Just want you to see it. Now, the Bible says in verse 2, parenthetically, there are 11 days journey from Horeb, which is Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir, straight up, unto Kadesh Barnea. 
What's the significance of this? A journey that should have taken them 11 days because of their disobedience to God took them 40 years. I wonder how much time in our lives have we lost in disobedience, in times of rebellion, times of backslidden, time we spent backslidden. You left the church, and then some people backslid in the church, never left, but I wonder, wonder how... How uh, much time have you um, wasted? It should have taken them from leaving Mount Sinai. So they stayed in Sinai for at least a year. So in Sinai, when God gave them the, the commandments. And, and the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. And it was a powerful, powerful uh, uh, thing. Uh, uh, and and it was it was just God doing mighty things for the children of Israel, but they stayed in Sinai for a year. And uh, and you can read about uh, uh, Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter nineteen. We don't have time today to go over all this. It's just interesting just to study the the Bible is just so fascinating. No matter what you're reading, if you're not reading the Bible, you're reading the wrong thing. Read your Bibles. Amen. Study your Bibles. Amen. And uh, the more you read it, the more God will reveal it to you. Invest in your biblical library. Praise the Lord. Now, an 11-day journey of 150 miles took them 40 years. Verse 3 says, And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, and on the first day of the month, that Moses spake to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment Unto them. So Moses began to give a history lesson. In the history lesson, God says this in verse 8 Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. I swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give unto them and to their seed after them. Go in. I've already made your forefathers a promise. The land is yours. Are you following me? He says, and I, verse 9, and I spake unto you that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven. Just as God promised Abraham, Abram, in Genesis chapter number 15. He says, I'm going to make you a people and you're going to be like the sand on the seashore and of the stars of heaven. I'm going to multiply you. And Moses said, God did it. And he promised him this land. He says, when the time of the Amorites are fulfilled, I'm going to bring you back to this land. Now, you're going to go and you're going to be in bondage for 400 years, but I'm going to bring you back. God told Abraham these things. So now here's Moses uh, giving a history lesson. 
And, and wouldn't it be nice if we knew uh, a little more about our history? One of the things that I don't like about Black History Month is that it's liberal Black History Month. We only point out liberal blacks. Say something. Our history is a rich history. And then we, the way we tell it, uh, um, we don't talk about the greatness of our story, how we've overcome. Everybody now is still uh, a victim when God has been good to us. Amen. God have been good to our nation. Moses gave a recant of history. Verse 19, he says, and when we departed from Horeb, that is, when we left Mount Sinai, I need you to follow me, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, that depressed land that I was telling you about. Hard to walk on. Very little vegetation. None in certain places. Very little water. None in certain places. Very little food. None in certain places. Hence, God giving them water from the rock. God sending quail. The Lord uh, giving them miracles. God being a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He led them through this tough, tough, tough terrain. We're so spoiled today that uh, I think 20 minutes in the wilderness, we would have just turned back and went on, went on back to Egypt because, you know, we can't take anything now. The church is, church is amazing. You know, I'm, I'm moved by all these pastors now who have a new gospel. You can't pay them to open their church, but now they're preaching, take the shot. That's the new text. I want to preach today from this subject. Take the shot. Oh, Lord. The shot now is, the, is, is our Messiah and Savior. The shot that's offered to us by and large by a bunch of depopulationists. Don't get me started. Depopulationists. Blacks are the main ones on the menu by default. Start with us. And a, a, a good, healthy skepticism is good. Asking questions is a good thing. Amen. Anytime they put, promote something that where if you disagree, you are scrubbed from social media. If you disagree and you're, and you're in the medical profession, your job is threatened or canceled. And all this cancel culture, that, that doesn't make me believe what they're telling me. It makes me doubt it more. See, because if, if it's the real thing, let, let everybody have that say. You don't like that, do you? So he says, uh, he, we went through that great and terrible wilderness which you saw by the way of the mountains of the Amorites as, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. It took us 11 days from leaving Sinai and we got to Kadesh. Barnea. Way before 40 years, we got there. We arrived there. And Moses said, and when we got there, he said, and I said to you, I don't blame you, Moses. I said to you, you are come unto the mountains of the Amorites which the Lord our God doth give you, doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it 
as the Lord thy God, the Lord God of thy fathers, hath said unto thee. He's already given it to you. He's already told you that it's yours. Fear not. Why did he say fear not? Because they were afraid. So he says, fear not, neither be discouraged. Go, possess the land. And I love, I love what he said. And he said, verse 22, and you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, we will send men before us that they may search out the land. See, Numbers 13 and 1 will lead you to believe that the initial idea to send spies was God's, but it was not. Why you got to spy out and test the water if God said do a thing? Why you got to add your logic, your common sense, your reasoning, your deductions to what God have said. If God said it, do it. Obey it. God told them, I've given you the land. It's yours. Go in and possess it. And they said to Moses, no, no, uh-uh. We have a better strategy. Ain't that something? Now, they were that smart. Why did they need Moses to deliver them from Egypt? They needed a leader. God gave them one. And so he told them what God said. And they said, no, we will send men before us that they may search out the land and bring us word again by the way we must go up. And in, into what city we shall come. And uh, the great mighty Moses signed his death warrant. He sealed his fate in his response. Verse 23 says, and the saying pleased me well. He should have pushed back and said, no, we're going in. See, because had, he go, had they gone in, Moses wouldn't have served long enough to hit the rock. Twice when God said, speak to it. See, none of that had happened at this time. The people never would have gotten to him the way they got to him had he gone in and did it God's way. Oh, the things we pick up in life when we disobey God. The things we bring on ourselves. And I like Moses. Moses let him know it wasn't me. I told you all what God said, but he should have pushed back. He should have pushed back. He says, and the saying pleased me well, and I took 12 men, one of a tribe. You can almost juxtapose what he did now, what he's saying now, to Numbers 13. I took 12 men, Numbers 13, 3 through uh, 16 names all name all of the men that they selected. You can read it at your leisure. And so they they took the the 12 men. I'm still in Deuteronomy now, chapter one. Verse 24 says, and they turned and went up into the mountain, and came unto the valley of Escol, and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and, and brought it down unto us and brought us word again, saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Woo! 
It's a good land. Uh, juxtapose this to, compare this rather, to uh, uh, chapter 13 and verse um, 23. And they came unto the brook Eskol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And uh, they bear it, look at this, upon, bear it between two upon a staff. Ooh, them grapes had to be good. And uh, they brought the pomegranates. You know, pomegranates are very good for you. Full of antioxidants. Cut out some of all that fried stuff and eat some pomegranates. Pomegranates and, uh, and, 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 and figs. Figs are full of fiber. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This, ain't no, this is not a dietary uh, message, but uh, you need fiber. And our... Uh, the, the, the place was called the Brook Eskol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel, Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. They were in Kadesh Barnea, an, o an oasis in the wilderness, south of Canaan. Amen. And brought back word unto them, unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. Brought it back and let everybody see it. Can you imagine how those people felt? Having walked 150 miles, waiting in uh, barren Kadesh. And they bring clusters of grapes and pomegranate back. And they told him and said, we came unto the land where thou sentest us. And surely it flowed with milk and honey, which is a, a Hebraic expression that means prosperity. And, uh, and, and uh, this, the, the particular idiom, this is the fruit of it. Here's the proof. They brought back evidence. Here's the proof of it. And the people went, oh, Lord, thank you, God. We made it. We're going in. God is good. But Deuteronomy 1 and 26, along with uh, Numbers 13 and 28. Numbers 13 and 28 says, nevertheless, Deuteronomy 1 and 26 says, notwithstanding. Let's stay with Deuteronomy. Notwithstanding, withstanding ye would not go up. Even with this, the withstanding ye would not go up, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Say so it's a good land that God have given us. He says, Moses says, withstanding, you would not go up. You resisted. You rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hate us, he have brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us unto the hands of the Amorites, and uh, uh, and to to destroy us. Look at this. Whether shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged. That is, have melted our hearts. That's what we've seen in the church. The hearts of saints are melted. Christians aren't faithful like we used to be. We're afraid. We, we're melted. We're melted. We're melted. This is a a melted church. Bible says in Numbers 13 and 28, nevertheless, the people, old English, be strong that dwell in the land. Yes, everything that God said about the land is true, but Scott, that's a problem. I actually wrote in my Bible, Scott. 
Because everybody was ready to go. And they, they threw in a not so fast. Said the people uh, 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 are strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled. And uh, very great. And moreover, and that ain't all. If that wasn't bad enough, we saw the children of Anak there. Apparently, some of the giants or their seed uh, somehow survived the flood. It says, and the Amalekites, the Amalekites dwelled in the, in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwelled in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwelled in the sea by the coast of Jordan. The, 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 the cities are walled. They are fenced. The people are huge. There are giants there. The Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites are there. We, it, it's true, uh, we've been, we're here. It's true that the food is there. It's all true. But they got all these people there. Now you're seeing why God did not want them to send spies. See, the Lord knew. As sure as those spies go in there, and you can pick the best men, they're going to see things that's going to frighten them. Don't you know that God knew when he promised the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the land would be occupied. He never promised them an unoccupied land. Hallelujah. He never said that the cities wouldn't be walled. He never said that there would not be a resistance. God just said, it's yours. See, that's an, er that an erroneous doctrine in biblical Christianity. You know, you can tell when God is using you. Because when it's God, everything just falls into place. That's not true. Many times the sign that it is God is that nothing falls into place. Matter of fact, anytime it's God, you'll know that it's God because a few folk going to be there in your way, a few obstacles, however they manifest. But you can tell that it's God because there's going to be some Jebusites, Amorites, and Canaanites. There is going to be adversity. There is going to be something. See, when God gives you an assignment, he never gives you an assignment that is uh, within your grasp. See, God always gives you, when God gives you something, it's, you, it, it takes an element of faith, an element of believing him to bridge the gap between your ability and, uh, and, and, and obtaining the thing uh, yourself. And, uh, and the reason the Lord does this, it, it, keep, it keeps us humble. Yes, sir. Right. Keeps you humble. So it's just, you tell it's God because it's just beyond your reach. They got there and saw the, uh, the, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and told the people, we can't do it. Deuteronomy said they melted the hearts of the people. Discouraged the people. Look at this verse. Deuteronomy 1 and 28 says, Whether uh, shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged, have melted our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Moses says, Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you, in Egypt before your eyes. But, but now, before Moses said this, Numbers tells us that Caleb stood up. So the Bible is something. I'm filling in the blanks. Caleb was the first one to speak up. 
Caleb said, uh, uh, Numbers 13 and 30, and Caleb stealed uh, the people before Moses. Moses hadn't said a word yet. And the people, that they're already murmuring. Caleb says, calm down, calm down, calm down. Come on, y'all, whoa, 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 stop. And said, let us go up at once. He didn't even address what the other ten said. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, look at this, look at this, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Do you see that? Mm, mm. See, Caleb and Joshua uh, shouted, let's go. The other 10 shouted, no. See, their unbelief challenged the character of God. Verse 31 says, but the men that went up said unto him, we are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. And the Bible says this. This is interesting. It says, and they brought up an evil report. Can I park right here for a second? I told you it was preach, teach day, right? Evil report. Uh, deba, evil, is the uh, Greek word Hebrew word, excuse me. It means to slander. It means a bad report. This word is used, I want you to hear this, to describe that which may be true, but to report it in a negative way. I won't, I won't let that sink in. To describe that which may be true, but in a negative way. Think of all that's being described in the news that may be true, but it keeps you home from church. Keeps us from doing the will of God. Shut churches down. Praise the Lord. Describing what may be true, because now you have to admit, most of what the ten spies said was indeed factual. The Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Anakims were there. The cities were walled. They didn't lie about that. The fruit was wonderful. Everything they said was factually correct, but until they put their perspective on it, uh, when they put their slant on it, they slanted it to block the program of God. That, that, that's, that's a lot going on in this world, but the world has put such a slant on it. The slant have you afraid. The slant makes us see things that are not there. The slant uh, discourages us from obeying God. They, and King James translated uh, their report. He called it an evil report. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. 
And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which comes of the giants. All right? And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. Oh, their perspective was messed up because now the spies began to see themselves as Canaan saw them. See, the church is in trouble when the church views itself the way the world views the church. See, that's, that's why Kurt Franklin preached against homophobia in the church, but not homosexuality in the church. See, Kurt has let the world, world's view of the church affect his view of the church. So he sees the church through the lenses of the world. He's not the only one. When you, oh, the world calls the church judgmental and self-righteous and all of that. Now we see ourselves through the same lenses. And almost now we're in a church that has no direction. You don't know what you can preach because, you know, if, if, if you can't, uh, if, if, if whatever we preach, we're going to be labeled as racist. You know, I made that, I made that uh, list. Black as I am. We're going to be called uh, racist, judgmental, homophobic, and all that. So what are we, what are we to do? Should we just ask Kurt and the world? Should I just call him and say, hey, man, what can I preach? What can I say? A singer. Well, a talker. A songwriter. A tremendous songwriter. Tremendous song, but he's no singer. Ain't nobody ever accused him of that. So a talker is instructing the church. I don't have time for this one. I'll show him in the, uh, 11 when I got more time. Uh, a comedian, Steve Harvey, is instructing the church on how we should mix Christianity with Islam. And Steve now, a comedian. What's wrong with us? A comedian now is telling us that there's more than one way to heaven. So I guess we actually are supposed to take Steve Harvey's word over God's word. Now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. John 14 and 6. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But Steve puts on a Muslim garb and finds a mosque that has the name Jesus on it. The mosque of Mary, of Jesus, the son of Mary or something. Which, you know, part of Islamic doctrine is to fool you. And so what we're supposed to do based on Steve Harvey is to abandon our belief that Jesus is the only Savior because Steve Harvey says so. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with him? Let me tell you something. L listen. Uh, and he bases it on because he made it. Made it where? Made what? Okay, you have you have money. Is that, is that the way? Is that the definition of made it? You have fame. Is that the is that what qualifies you to speak against orthodoxy? The settled teachings of the church? Because you can cuss and make somebody mad and you got a gig on the family feud. Does that qualify you to cross and challenge the words of our Savior? So you have to watch all these preachers who are bought and sold by Oprah. They want to be on, on, on. So are we to go along with them? I want to know from you whose report are you going to believe? Yeah. Who do you believe? And it seems like to me we always overdo it. Now I don't, it may be, 
and, and for the white folk who are here, if, they, if you know them, tell me. There may be some white comedians or uh, choir directors who try to tell the church what to believe. Seems like to me, we just get all out of our lane. All of a sudden, a comedian go teach the church. A blue joke comedian at that. And, and why teaching the church if you, if you push him just a little bit? Profanity come right out of his mouth. But he, but he doesn't feel bad because a lot of preachers are like that. So Let, 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 let me leave that alone. Don't you view yourself, upper room, saints who, who, who will see this later. Do not let the world define you. Don't let the world tell you who you are. <laughs> Praise the Lord. From the outside looking in, you can't see this anyway. A man can't see the kingdom of heaven except he be born again. You got to be saved to understand this. Got to be washed in the blood to see it right. So you out there with your little toddy, your liquor and all that stuff in your hands, you can't understand this anyway. Don't understand our motives. Don't understand our why. My God. And, and, and anybody who attacks the doctrine, the church ought to push back. We don't have enough Joshua's. We don't have enough Caleb's. And we don't have enough Moses. The Bible said, and, and the verse 33 says, and, and we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we're as grasshoppers in our own eyes. See, the ten spies saw barriers. The two saw blessings. The ten saw giants, but the two saw God. Hallelujah. Let me just uh, uh, hang around Deuteronomy for just a few more minutes. I'm, I'm watching the clock. Look at what happened now. Look at what happened. Uh, leading to Numbers 14. He says, in, in Deuteronomy chapter number 1 verse 30 says, And the Lord your God, which goeth before you, shall fight for you according to all that he did in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God, you saw in the wilderness as we walked 150 miles, you saw how God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until you came to this place. Yet in this thing did, this thing did, ye did not, excuse me, believe the Lord your God. In this thing you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out uh, a place to pitch your tent in, in fire by night, to show you by what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. Look at the benefits. The Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swearing, saying, Surely there shall, there, listen, there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give to their fathers. Not one of them are going to enter in. Be careful during this time. Be careful in the COVID crisis in the world, this national pandemic, what comes out of your mouth. Don't mess around and write a check that your behind can't cash. Don't, ca don't cancel your future. Don't cancel what God has for you by walking and talking doubt. If you ain't strong enough to believe, just be quiet. 
But God is going to do something with all of these enemies of the church who fight and criticize and post against churches for being open. You're canceling your own future. If I be a man of God, you will see it. You see, you have to be careful when you, what you say uh, in real time. In the midst of the trial, you have to be careful. If you can't speak up for God, don't say anything. But then you can't stay quiet too long. But we're not called to be quiet. And we're not called to be indifferent. We're called to speak up. But if you don't have the anointing to speak up, you better ask God to anoint you to shut up. It's good preaching this morning. This is good, good preaching. You, you see me walking slow, don't you? Yes, sir. He said, uh, the Lord was angry, saying, verse 35, uh, saying, there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see the good land. Verse 36, except, King James says, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it. To him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon and to his children because he hath wholly followed the Lord. What will God say about us through this? Also the Lord was angry with me, Moses says, for your sake, saying, thou also shall not go in thither. See, Moses is telling this after the fact. See, by the time Dr. Pete, he stood and gave this history lesson, he had already hit that rock twice. See, he knew, I'm not going in either. Listening to you all, I should have went when God told me to go, but I hung out too long. He says, nobody's going to get it but Caleb, in verse 38, but Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in there. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, look at this, look at this, look at this. I think this is a big deal right here. Moreover, your little ones, which you said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in there. And unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. See, you thought that following my way was bad for your children. See, you were under the impression that to obey me would endanger your children. And God is saying quite to the contrary. Now your children are going to go into a land that you will not see. You should have trusted me. You and your children could have gone in had you trusted me. Let me tell you something, parents. Your children don't need to sow their wild oats. Your children don't need to experiment with marijuana, drugs. And so don't you, don't you, don't you encourage them to do that. Trust God. I can't hardly get an amen. Robinson, God's way, praise the Lord, facing God's way is better for your children. You got to protect your children from the church. You got to protect your children from God. Some of you act like you, your home is a better place for your family than church. And you have the attitude that you're protecting your family. Who do you think you are? You're just a puny man. It takes God to watch over us. I'm not down with this stuff. These subtle, false teachings that creep in to make you think that you're somehow over the top or don't know what you're doing because you choose to believe God. God's been a much better father to Crystal and Patrick than I could ever be. 
God have watched over my children and my family much better than I ever could. I am limited. I am limited. There are so many things that I can't do anything about. I can only be in one place at one time. I don't feel good every day. My strength is very limited. I'm limited. But oh, my God is unlimited. He's everywhere. He can watch over every one of us even when we're in four different locations. God will still God forgive us for many of us have bought the devil's lie and we treat our children as though the world's way that we're actually protecting them and we're exposing them and we're doing good by them. We're being responsible. See, you, you, world, 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 that's the world. See, carnality. See, sometimes carnality can get on you and you don't recognize it, but thank God for a good preacher. I'll show it to you. Just hang around. Just keep coming to church. And when you see it, just ask God to forgive you. Amen. All of us have, have, to, have to repent. But don't you think, don't you think that the world's way is better than the church? The saints, the saints, now you're going to sit on me. The saints didn't let in times past homework keep their children from attending church. Now the Christian parents will not let their children attend church because they have homework. See, we, we assume that our way is better than God's way. So God said, you know what? The same children that you were trying to protect. I, I get it. God said your intention was good. But you thought disobeying me was good for your children. I tell you what. You're going to die in the wilderness. And they are going to go into the land. They are going to see it. And you won't. God, this is good. See, any, see, when you put anything or anybody before God. See, that's idolatry. And see, it never works out. It never work out the way you think that it would. That's a trick of Satan. That's a trick of Satan. You're going to risk their future. You're going to risk everything. Chasing something. Because you think that that's better for them than God's house, God's church, God's way. Which of your parents have sat down and taught your children to tithe? How many of you have taken the time to teach them to pray? How many have talked to them about the importance of attending church? How many have talked to them and told them well, when you go to college, you're going to be on that campus. You're going to see a lot of things, but don't forget what you've been taught. Don't forget the word of the Lord. Don't forget to stand for Jesus Christ. How many have warned them that there are perils in Kadesh Barnea? There are perils in the land of Canaan. But if you trust God, God will make a way. Because he knows what's best. All of a sudden, the enemy of marriage have become church services. As soon as you start talking about balance, we need balance. You, you don't balance our work. You don't balance our play. You don't balance out anything you don't want to balance out. But you want to balance the church now. Yeah, Pastor, we're having too many services. We need family time. Well, can't, can't you cut somewhere else? How, how about worship being the last place instead of being the first place? Oh, y'all got, I told y'all go silence. Yeah. Well, I know what you're saying now. You, I should have slept in. You sure should have. And uh, we ain't having no Valentine's Day service. That ain't no Christian holiday. There's nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with it, but you know, that, that don't belong in here. Oh! I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. We, we began, we, we, you know what we did? We began to view ourselves through the eyes of Canaan. And we saw ourselves as grasshopper. The grasshopper, there's a, reason, there's a reason why I mentioned that. The grasshopper was the smallest animal that the people, that the Jews were allowed to eat. 
and 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 be, still be considered uh, not animal insect and and it be considered clean so he, he says you know you, you know you ain't nothing when you compare yourself to the smallest edible insect that's how we see ourselves because that's the way the world see, see us no wonder it, it was it was it became an industry no wonder it became a subject of of uh of conferences after conference. No wonder we could stand up in here and teach that coming here is somehow a threat to the balance of family. No wonder. I feel like the man on Kung Fu now. Grasshopper. I feel the chill. But you know, Patrick Wooden loves preaching in the chill, as long as it ain't air conditioned. <laughs> you turn that down, oh, man, I got, to, I got to go. Oh, y'all don't like me, but I'm right. We bought, we bought, we bought it. God says, you know, you were trying, you were trying to protect your children. I'm telling you, they're going in and you're not. Because you thought that my way, my way was against your family. That somehow obeying me is going to hurt your marriage. When the truth is, I always, you know I never bought that. Here's what I knew. No woman on this planet would have came out of here marrying Patrick Wooden without the influence of the church. Because I would not have done right. Wouldn't have treated you right. Amen. Well, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. Now, I know some of you guys, you would have. But it's all right. I'm telling you, the best thing that happened to me, the best thing was Jesus Christ, the influence of the church, praise the Lord, the teachings of the kingdom. It taught me morality. It taught me hard work. It taught me discipline. It taught me stick to itiveness. It taught me how to be a good husband and a good father. And you mean to tell me, you let the world, because I know some of you, I know you, you wouldn't have been anything either. Because most of us with the Holy Ghost at times struggle. Because we're raised not to be good. Little girls are raised to have a boyfriend when she's 30. Little boys are raised to have 10 girlfriends at nine. Ray, you know what I'm telling you, raised to lie. And then you get saved. And all the, the kingdom takes all that out of you. And, and, and some of us, the kingdom took it out in time. Some got delivered right away, but others, you know, it took a minute, you know. You wandered in the wilderness 40 years. <laughs> but at least you got in Canaan. Praise the Lord. You, amen. You arrived. Say amen. Say amen again. Say it for the third time. The church. God's plan was better than theirs but Moses said your plan pleased me well now I'm going to stop right here because I'm out of time I, I, so uh, I can't I'm not going to jump in the text and, and go fast and do it a disservice we'll pick this up uh, we'll pick it up uh, Thursday night we're going to talk some more but be careful See, Christianity Christianity is the best thing that ever happened the ways of God, best thing that ever happened yes, to our country, to our lives, to the world. The best thing that ever happened uh, to mankind was for Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross. That was number one. The second thing, second best thing that happened was for it to be written down so that we could get it and learn about it. And then for it to be preached. And then God figured out something. God said that they can't live it on their own. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come and live it in them. I'll fill them with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost will give them power to live this life. 
I want you to stand right now. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God to exercise from all of us that spirit of murmuring. Father, in Jesus' name, take away that spirit. Israel murmured themselves into 40 years of wandering. Oh, an entire generation died. Literally 500,000 to 800,000, maybe over a million people died. Died. Oh, the number of families that lost their dad. The number of families that lost their mom. God, they wandered until Aaron died. They wandered until Miriam died. They wandered until Moses died. They saw so much death. They, they wasted, they lost so much time. They ate so much dust. They endured so many things because they wouldn't obey you. And because they murmured, God, touch us right now. We rebuke that murmuring spirit. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We will not be like the world. We will praise you. We will glorify you. We will confess that our hands are in your hands, that you know what you're doing in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this teaching. It is the exact one we need, the right one at the right time to get us through the crazy times like these in the name of Jesus. So Father, we praise you and we believe you and we give you all of the glory. And Father, we confess today that the word of the Lord is right and that your ways are better for us than our ways will ever be. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praises right now. Give him praises. Give him praises.